Now look, uh, uh, we are going to meet uh, Father Raymond Gavronsky more fully over the next couple of days, and I'll tell you a whole lot more about him as we come to that. He is a, a, a Jesuit priest, a, a Jesuit of the Maryland province. He comes from New York, but his family is obviously Polish. He's a professor at St. John Vianney Seminary in Denver in Colorado. He's also a spiritual director, and he's great fun. And as I said to him today, now, Father, you're going to open the batting. Um, he's the first speaker. He said, yes, I am. And it occurred to me later, how on earth would an American priest know anything about a cricketing term, opening the batting? And then my friend Bill Moore, who's an American, said, of course he would. It's like calling a batter up for a game of baseball. Of course it is. Ladies and gentlemen, to open the batting on the theme of hope that we all carry so deeply in our hearts, would you please welcome Father Raymond Gavronsky of the Society of Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, we might begin with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve, to thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, and eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O, son, o sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. St. Faustina. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A wise old Jesuit told me to always do this at the beginning of a talk. It reassures your audience. I hope you can understand me. Uh, I had a seminarian who spent three, three you know, a semester in New Zealand, and he said for three months he didn't understand a word. And uh, Winston Churchill said, of course, the English and the Americans were two nations divided by a common tongue. So I, I hope you can make sense of what I say to you. I guess I'm on the screen over there. I'd never seen myself on a screen until I made the series for EWTN. Uh, I did a, a, a retreat series for them, which was televised. And until then, I was in my 40s, and I just was amazed at my head of hair. And I used to comb it in the mornings, and I, you know, it was just a nice, nice blonde head of hair. And then finally, when I saw myself on TV, I said, you're bald. <laughs> the illusions we have about ourselves never seem to stop. So I'm here to talk about hope in three parts. Uh, I'm glad to be in New Zealand, very, very blessed to be with you. I've just had a wonderful week on the South Island. When I was asked to come here, well, I was uh, excited for a number of reasons. I had known Bishop uh, Dunn's sister 25 years ago when I was a student in California. So there's a connection with New Zealand there. And my uh, brother-in-law used to do work in Ar Antarctica, and my sister would come here with him. And then, of course, when The Lord of the Rings came out, wow, I saw that many times and own it, and I just thought if I could get to uh, Fangorn Forest, which I think I did last week, I'd be very happy. So I've loved being over here. And while traveling through the southern island last week, I was struck by the tremendous beauty of the landscape. I mean, I think a lot of people think of New Zealand as kind of a paradise. Uh, Americans kind of say, well, this is in many ways the way America was many years ago before we got so very, very crowded and hyper-developed, things like that. And driving across that beautiful fjord land uh, where you just think, oh, if I could only live here, you know, how wonderful this would be. There'd be no traffic and no, not, not the pressure of schedules and all this thing. It just seems so idyllic, paradisical. In the middle of a field, there was a large cross, a large cross. And I said, why would you have that here? Everything seems so perfect. But of course, this is planet Earth, and the cross tells things the way they are. As I thought about these talks, I thought of the great phrase, Ave cro uh, Crux Spes Unica, Hail, O Cross, Our Only Hope. Now. I came back to the States 
15 years ago when these Congresses began, in 93, after many years in Europe, I had left the states in some despair, uh, hopelessness for the church. I lived in Rome for many years. I was very happy there. And the Lord sent me back to the states to work, and I came in time for the Eucharistic, well, the, the papal visit to Denver. I translated there for the Holy Father, John Paul, and a whole new life opened up for me. So that mission of hope, the witness to hope that he brought to us, is something I see myself as kind of continuing. But it's odd that I was asked to speak on hope. When the topic was given me, I thought, oh my word, I'm the biggest pessimist I know. Uh, I'm kind of a one-man darkness club. I, I don't think you have many Slavic people here, so you probably don't know what the Slavic soul is like, but I mean it's just dark, darker, darkest. Uh, and so just a Slavic pessimist by nature. It's in my blood. And yet earlier this year, my provincial, quite before these talks came up, uh, he said to me on a visit I had back east that he said, I was a pillar of hope. And I have no idea why he called me that, except probably I've, I've dealt so much with uh, despair. And so I, I'm going to be talking about that hope for the next few days. The title of my talk was given me is Hope Springs Eternal. The words are poetically pregnant. Now, New Zealand is probably more civilized than the United States, so there may be no need to cite the poem. But the, the words Hope Springs Eternal, of course, comes from, come from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Let me read a few of the lines around that. Who sees with equal eye as God of all, a hero perish or a sparrow fall, atoms or systems into ruin hurled, and now a bubble burst and now a world. Hope humbly then, with trembling pinions soar, wait the great teacher death and God adore. What future bliss he gives not thee to know, but gives that hope to be thy blessing now. Hope springs eternal in the human breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. The soul uneasy and confined from home rests and expatiates in a life to come. Man never is, but always to be blessed. As human beings, we are of ourselves pilgrims. We're on the way, via Torres. And the call that pulls us forward through our lives is always something beyond and above us to what we might call tomorrow as we strive to burst through or at least muddle through the darkly wrapped world of this earthly today. Tomorrow beckons us because it promises something more, something different, something better. That's most naturally and powerfully present in the young, who have a biological dynamism which would bear all before it. I've been blessed for years to be a teacher, first at the university and now at the seminary. And uh, I never, I, older people used to say this to me, but now I really see how wonderful it is to be with young people, because there's just a natural buoyancy, no matter what happens carries you through. There's, there's an energy, life. But I'd like to begin my reflection on hope by taking you with me on some walks through things I've experienced in my own sojourn uh, in this veil of tears. So my talk is going to be somewhat autobiographical in places. And before I go further, I'll tell you, when I talk, it's rather like William Butler Yeats spoke of gyres. So I kind of circle, hopefully like a bird that's rising, hopefully not on too much hot air. And, but just to keep you in focus of where I'm going, let me give you a, a two-minute precy of what I'm going to be trying to say. In 1971, when I graduated from college, I was asked to inspire the university with a valedictory address, actually on hope. And that was based on the vision of the 1960s. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And in the face of the collapse of the preceding decades, I counseled despair of all facile hopes, seeking satisfaction in the delight of being. 
Now, 40 years later, I've been asked to speak again on hope. I see a certain hope as a good trace of God's hand in his creation. It's a drive which is beyond all movement. But I also see natural hope as inherently condemned to futility. Original sin has cut off our natural drives from their perfect fulfillment. The most basic desire is for what the Holy Father calls, or reminds us, is eternal life. A state of bliss and perfection which we see incarnate in various images held up for us. For much of the human race, much of the time, tomorrow in itself represents hope, but it's a truly blind hope, which in itself doesn't bear much investigation because it offers only false images of eternity. If only this moment could last, whatever that moment is, whatever the ecstasy is, it promises eternity and it disappoints. And that's the, that's, that's the promise and the tragedy of human life. It's like the Catholic doctrine of creation. Creation is good and gives God glory, but without redemption, fallen creation cannot fulfill that which God had and has in mind. So that's kind of where I'm going to be going in this first reflection with you this evening. So when I was graduating from this Jesuit college in Massachusetts in 1971, I was selected as student speaker. I felt a great weight upon me. Oh, you're young, you want to say everything. I had lots of opportunities, lots of things given. And I'd like to take you back to that time a little bit because we're going to look a little bit at the world and what the world promises. In the 60s, from the American point of view, we'd gone through a lot. The Kennedy brothers were killed. The Vietnam War was reaching its apex or its nadir. We'd had race riots tearing up our cities. There seemed to be a breakdown of government and the countercultural revolution, which is all around us, all over the world, had begun. So it was against that background, that background of hopes, all these hopes come alive in the 60s and in the crashing of them that I gave the talk. I spent a couple of months preparing the talk, talking to people, listening to them on campus, and I didn't want to just get up and give a talk on basis of what I thought. Opinions varied among the young people. What do you say? What are we living for? Some people wanted to drop out. They wouldn't take part in even the graduation from the college. Other people were going to become young businessmen, the kind of yuppies that have become the pillars of the kind of corporate world. But one of the Jesuits who ran the college gave me a book on the political tradition of the Kennedys. He said, this should inspire us. This political vision, this is what you want to talk about. Gave me the book, talk about this. But I couldn't because they represented something that seemed to be dying. Hopes were dying. The hopes of the flower children were being shattered in various forms of violence, and then this emergence of this new corporate world. Other hopes were being born in those days. The Jesuits, my order, had strongly committed itself to a brand of social justice which was not unrelated to strong currents of Marxism. Revolution in the world the past 50 years at that time trying to build a, a utopian vision in this world. But there was an atmosphere of dis disappointment, even despair, by some people, but also an atmosphere in which people spoke of the hopes which an apparent spirit of liberalism in the persons of the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, uh, John the Twenty-Third, brought to the church. But I didn't speak on hope. As a matter of fact, I earned a certain amount of uh, criticism from the Jesuit community. I, I was a layman at the time. But I, because I told this story, it's originally from Asia. It was picked up by Tolstoy, the Russian novelist. And it goes like this. There's a man who's being chased across a plain by a tiger running for his life. He comes to the edge of a cliff and he has to jump. Now, hanging over that cliff, there's a branch. There's a vine. He jumps and he clings onto that branch for dear life. He's hanging over a ledge, but he looks down, and there's a dragon. They can't fall down onto the ledge. And he looks to the base of the branch, and there are two mice nibbling away <laughs> at the branch. 
what does he do? There are many answers, but the version that I heard was this. He saw two drops of honey from a comb, honeycomb, on the branch. He reached up, he licked the honey, and said, ah. We'll return to that. <laughs> That's what he did. Well, that was in 1971. This is 2008. And God, 37 years later, and you've invited me to speak about hope. Well, I propose a three-part scheme for these three talks that I'm going to give. Today, we're talking about just hope, plain hope. That is to say, the hope for tomorrow, hope as we know it in the world, seen most clearly in youth and childhood. Tomorrow's theme is hope's disappointed. Let's hope it rains. And that we'll be talking about yesterday. And that my word for that is yesterday, or middle age despair. The final talk will be on hope reborn, and we'll call that today, or the resurrection. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Shakespeare's words, which take a, a dark turn, give expression to the beat of the human heart, don't they? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. All creation turns, every human being feels something about tomorrow. If I can only get a night's sleep, you may be well thinking that at this moment. If I can only get through this day and get into bed, no matter how bad the day has been, somehow tomorrow things will work out. Right? We tell our children that. And not only will they work out, but somehow they'll be better. It's how we live our lives. A natural hope. All nature has it. Feeding into this natural hope that we have, things will be better tomorrow, there's a core belief of the modern world in progress. The Pope's encyclical indicates that this replacement of the hope of heaven, of redemption in Christ, and of life based on faith and tradition, replaced by a life based on ideals of reason and freedom, brought us a doctrine of earthly progress, and it was largely the responsibility of Francis Bacon, he maintains. Combined with the subsequent doctrine of evolution, this is the real religious creed of our world today. A professor I had many years ago named Houston Smith coined a word for it. He called it prevolution, progress and evolution. We have to put up with all kind of things, but we do it because it's the price of progress. If we want progress, we have to put up with this. And underneath it is this doctrine of evolution that somehow everything is moving towards a better goal. This is our modern creed. Our world has taken on the forms of it. Every day, in every way, things are getting better. At least that's very American but I presume you have something of that in your world here as well. We're used to it. It's defined our existence for a long time. But not all peoples have had such a fortunate run as the English-speaking peoples have had for some centuries now. It's mostly our world, English-speaking world, which has gone from strength to strength as technological superiority opened up new worlds and doctrines of progress, evolution emerging for what became a secularized Christian vision which had supplied the sense that things are moving somewhere toward a goal. And that was a Christian vision. There's a goal. There's an end. But this has been turned from the goal being Christ, being eternal life in Jesus Christ, to the creation of an earthly utopia. And the, 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 the carrot on the stick is tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And it builds on our basic biological hope that tomorrow things will be better. Now, there's a fundamental Catholic principle, and it's so profoundly Catholic, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a theologian, so pardon me, I get excited about these things. But the principle is, grace builds on nature without destroying it. It's a wonderful, wonderful, profoundly Catholic principle. It basically is saying that nature is basically good, dented, original sin affects it, 
but basically good. And God's grace can build on nature without destroying it. It's profoundly Catholic. And though the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love are uniquely infused graces, still there are traces of faith, hope, and love found in all of human society. All human beings know something of hope or trust or love, no matter how disappointed they might become. So yes, hope springs eternal in the human breast. In springing eternal from the human breast, though, it's not just something that's in man. The plants move toward the sun. All creation responds to light. It's built into nature, and it mirrors and participates in the source of all being, the most holy trinity. And yet God easily becomes for us someone out there, someone we take for granted, a God figure, some abstraction, the creator. But there are traces of God in all of his creation, and all of creation is pointing somewhere. As St. Augustine famously says in the Confessions, we did all of creation. And Augustine says when you walk through a forest, all the trees and everything that's in the forest is saying, we did not make ourselves, God made us. And this is one of the great differences between creation the, and, and, and the non-human creation and human beings. Because human beings go through the world saying, me, look at me. Everybody's kind of saying, look at me. I'm different. I'm special. Look at me, 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 me. Trees don't say that. Birds don't say that. All of creation is giving glory to God. We did not make ourselves. God made us. And when we find hope in the human community, and we find it remarkably present, that in spite of so many terrible things that might happen, in spite of the fact that people are dying all around me, in spite of the fact that things may have gone wrong time and time and time again, I still let myself be seduced yet again by hope. I still look in the mirror and take my comb out of my pocket. In his poem on hope, the French Catholic poet Charles Peggy characterizes hope as the younger sister of faith and love who leads them by the hand where they might not go and who keeps leading them. He says 40 times, hope fools us time and time again. And yet the older sisters let themselves be fooled time and again because that's hope's charm, her beauty. There's simply in us something that naturally hopes for the best. It's in the very nature of things, then, that we hope, even though it would seem to go against experience and reason, as we shall soon see. If anything, I think the reasonable thing to do is to despair, as I counseled my audience to do back in 71. Now, back then, it seemed to me there was tremendous confusion everywhere I turned. And I'd like to share with you just a little bit about that. Some of you are of that generation, and you'll remember some of these things. I was born and raised in the Catholic Church before Vatican II. In those days, there were few questions and many certitudes. It was absolutely clear what the Catholic Church was and stood for, what she expected of her members, clear what Mass must, was, none was different from any other. Confessions, always on Saturday afternoons, you went there, you got in line along the wall, and there were no questions. There were these certitudes in plenty. With the coming of Vatican II, most of these certitudes seemed at least to be gone, and the question emerged, whom do you trust? That for my generation. You said that saying, don't trust anyone over 30. That used to seem very old. It was the watchword of the youth revolution. It was coined, I think, by Time magazine. But that wasn't entirely without its reason. You know, we've been told, for example, that, you know, things, so many strictly defined things. You know, you could eat a hamburger and, and on Friday you'd go to hell one year, but not the next. You see, this was confusing to people. No matter how you might argue about authority, psychologically the effects of those changes after decades of a very brittle form were devastating and produced great confusion, certainly in my country and probably here as well. Politically, uh, in the world I was raised in the 50s, it was a strongly anti-communist environment, especially young Catholics. The church was strongly anti-communist. Communism was seen as the godless atheistic scourge of the world, and indeed it was. It threatened the church in Italy, France. It was destroying Eastern Europe. The U.S., where I was raised, saw itself as a godly nation, but even then we were in the Vietnam War, 
and all the certitudes of earlier wars were being loudly challenged. Authority was being shaken, church authority shaken, civil authority was being shaken. Whether that was right or wrong doesn't matter, but you could cogently argue both sides of those things, and I'd seen them argued well. So what do you get a certain worldly cynicism was to be expected, given mixed messages we'd been receiving in great number? So when I was urged by the spiritual leadership of my college to talk on hope based on a vision of earthly progress, I simply felt I couldn't do it. And I did counsel despair of any easy, short-term solutions to things because I was convinced that the problems with which we were dealing were far, far deeper than anything these people imagined. The fact that Kennedy was killed was a terrible thing, John Kennedy, but he was not the first U.S. president to be assassinated. Regardless of his merits, he was not the savior of the world. The hopes in which we were being told to hope were not credible. In fact, they were mostly agendas being pushed by people who seemed to be trying to sell a product, enhance a career, make themselves look good, have something to live for. There was a song of the 60s called Abraham, Martin, and John, those of you who are really old might remember that, that spoke of these sainted martyrs for that cause. But it's puzzling in retrospect what all these crushed hopes were about. After all, what exactly was the promise of John Kennedy? What salvation were we to expect from someone who was young, virile, married to a beautiful woman full of riches and power? Were we looking for a Messiah in him? What would have happened had he lived? He'd be 90 now, you know. Would the hopes have been realized? Have such hopes ever been realized? I'm from the New York area. Uh, the, the accent's kind of gone. It only comes back uh, late at night. But uh, when I was in high school, there was a girl who won a raffle. And you have raffles over here. They used to raffle cars. She was 16 years old, and she won a Cadillac, like a Mercedes. And her comment was, oh, my God, she said, I've got a Cadillac at 16. What else is there to live for? OK. Hope. We have hope built into the very nature of our being as creatures because all creation, as I say, naturally turns to the sun. But it's our hidden, unacknowledged hopes that can deceive us and give real trouble in our lives. The things we hope for without even knowing it. Our hidden hopes are in many ways like time bombs that nature and nurture lay within us in the nursery. The hope for your life that your grandmother or grandfather or mother or aunt or somebody planted in you as a child, those expectations, more than even hopes, they detonate in midlife, those time bombs. They lead to crises and despair that often characterize those years. For example, that girl, the Cadillac girl, she'd identify the natural hope of human life with the realization by a very concrete material possession. My life is about getting a Cadillac. And you have the Cadillac, and then what? Hope was identified with an object, a goal, that was infinitely less than its proper object, which is God alone. Remember the old, in, in the United States, we have thing called the Baltimore Catechism. I'm sure you didn't have that here. But we were told, who, why did God make me? To know, love, and serve him in this world and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Right? Or in the next, same thing. Oh, there you go. The Catholic Church. Okay. It's funny. Years uh, when I, um, in these revolutionary years, I, I was a taxi driver in Honolulu for a while. Many stories there. Um, but I remember an island person coming up to me. I was a nighttime taxi driver sitting outside of a hotel. And he said to me, do you know the meaning of life? I mean, I was 21, and that's all we talked about was the meaning of life. And I, I puzzled about it, and I said, yes, man is created to know, love, and serve God and be happy with him you know, forever in heaven. Now, I wasn't quite living that, but at least the formula had been given me. <laughs> And what did the formula say? I'm made to know God. And what is God? Infinitely beyond everything we know. We're made for a reality vastly greater than anything we can imagine. And to, to, to limit that to, to a Cadillac is a bit like trying to take the ocean and fit it into a teacup. If we're built for oceanic spaces, being limited to a teacup is maddening. 
And every one of us is made in the image and likeness of God. And each one of us, every human being, is made to know God in this life and be happy with him for eternity. This is our dignity. And it opens our hearts to infinite spaces. This is hope. But if we take that hope and cut it down from infinity to something small, tiny, not worth it, the Cadillac, that becomes a form of hell. Oh, this is all I want, whatever it may be, another person. No, 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 we're made for God. With that hope realized, when I have it, no hope would remain. But of course, something of that hope will always be there, but forced into a mold so tight as to be permanently, even eternally, frustrating. But if hope springs eternal, the mold will be broken to be replaced with a new one. It's another banal saying, but it says, where there's life, there's hope. Well, it's true. As I say, when I thought about this as a student, my answer to the problem of this confusion of the goal of hope was seize the moment, carpe diem. That is to say, when you can't really trust anyone to be telling the truth, when all established systems are shaken, find something that's beautiful, that's pleasant, rejoice in it. But my spirit was heading towards a facile, a very easy, hedonism, life of pleasure, licking the honey and saying, ah. But if I were to reinterpret that now, I'd reinterpret it in line with St. Paul's teaching in Philippians, Philippians 4.8. It's a great passage. Well, and they all are. But this one goes, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I feel so badly for people, uh, you know, uh, I did, I, I've just been driving around the South Island. I mean, it, it's absolutely superb, just absolutely superb. It brought together the most beautiful places I've ever seen on the planet and kind of squared them and made them bigger even, right? Just magnificent. And then I got on the news, Air New Zealand plane this morning and they had all these screens pop down and there was MTV on there and someone was was making horrible noise, excuse me, I know de gustibus, but it wasn't Mozart, uh, in some broken down warehouse. Just ugliness, ugliness. I said, why are we looking at this? This is hopeless. There's no life in this. There's no beauty. It's ugly. It's demeaning. It's debasing. I don't know where that spirit comes from. What does Paul say? Again, true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, gracious, if there's any excellence, anything worthy about praise, think about these things that feeds your hope and not despair. God gives us so many good things on our way to him. But at the time, I mean, I did go to a facile hedonism, and I learned the price from what I paid in the coming years until I began to learn better, or so I hope. Hope springs eternal because God has placed the hope within us that we will see him. God has placed the hope within us, each of us, that we will see him. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of God. We're made for a light infinitely greater than anything this world has to offer. When we get into the light of God, as all the mystics tell us, the brightest, most brilliant light in this world will be a very sad darkness compared to the, the beauty, the beauty that lies ahead of us for which we live as Christians. We are pulled not by a star shining in the heavens, but by an infinite being pulling us upward with an eternal pull. And so, again, by nature, as God's children, we hope. And yet this hope, if it's merely earthly hope, is not enough for that to which, for which we're made. I don't know if you had this Broadway musical Annie around here, if you're familiar with it. It's some friends of mine loved it at the time. And there's this song, the sun will come up tomorrow, bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Tomorrow, tomorrow, and so on. So the wisdom of Annie. It's a, it's a ray thrown from the pull of life, which is the heart of our biological beings. Again, if hope springs eternal, it's because God, the creator of all that is, is eternal. 
and the human breast in which that hope springs is the seat of our tie to God. All creatures turn to the sun and follow it around as the source of their life that naturally turn to the light. But not all light is good. We have to be discerning. St. Paul tells us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. You know, we have to be wise. But at any rate, biologically, like the young lions of the Psalms, when light comes up, we rise from our dens, we're drawn up and out by the sun. Who among us doesn't know the discouragement of a weary day and the consoling words by a loving parent, sleep on it, tomorrow's another day. Th things will look different in the morning. And sure enough, after tears and a rough night, you wake with a fresh life, fresh desires, if only for coffee, and with hope that the fresh new day will bring new life. As I say, all of creation has this natural orientation towards its creator. In human beings, that's a residual trust that we have. And no matter the forces of atheist denial or sheer blindness, the hope remains. It keeps pulling us on. St. Therese of Lisieux, you know, observed very keenly how human beings naturally trust and presume the best. Children do that. It's so obvious. When children come up, they just trust you. You'll help them. That's just the way it is. And, and just by trusting you like that, they elicit that from you. You can be grizzled. You can be in a bad mood. You can be whatever. A little child comes up, need help. You're going to help them. And they, they trust that. Because by nature, we are inveterate optimists. Things will get better. But it's curious. More, more ancient cultures, those of Asia, have a much stronger sense of a wheel of fortune. That is to say, if things get better when they're worse, well, they'll also get worse when they're better. <laughs> cultures vary on this, and I'll be talking somewhat about cultures this weekend. I lived in Rome for five years. Uh, it was uh, wonderful, wonderful years. And we had an Italian doorman, Porter. He, he was proud that he could learn foreign languages. So one day he said to me, Padre, io parlo inglese. Father, I speak English. So I said, Roberto, how are you? He said, great, just great. I said, the Americans have gotten to him. A few, few weeks later, he came to me and he said, Padre, parlo polaco. Father, I speak Polish. I speak Polish. So I said to him, Roberto, jak się masz? And he said, coraz gorzej. Which in Polish, I said to him, how are you? And his answer was, Worse and worse. <laughs> if, if, if in those days you were to say to somebody in Poland, I'm doing great, they'd think you were absolutely insane because life isn't like that. Our languages carry things with them. You know, in, in Mandarin Chinese, at least classically, if you met someone, you would say, Ni chula fan meo. Huh? Have you eaten? It comes from a culture of starvation. You meet someone, the first thing you ask, have you eaten today? It, it became just a form. You say, true, no, true, yeah, I've, I've, I've eaten, I've eaten. But that reflects uh, experiences. But anyway, in our English-speaking world, as I say, we've been on a cultural roll for some centuries. I'm not sure uh, that's going to continue. But the optimism which we carry in our cultures is a residue of the Christian faith, but uh, it's in a modern technological kind of secularized version. As I say, this one-sided vision of progress is a secularized vision of the last day, the eschaton, where in fact everything in the end is set to right and ends well. But for centuries, it's been cut off from the divine and only has a this-worldly goal. Get on the treadmill, keep working, put up with stuff because things are going to get better. If not for us, then for our children. We're just all this-worldly. But the, 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 the supernatural dimension drops out. We may today be suffering from some incurable disease, but if we can only wait long enough or even have our bodies frozen, we can hope that down the line a cure can be found tomorrow. Now, I'm going to shift gears. In the New Testament, this is a time of the new creation. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is shown calling his apostles, beginning with the two sets of brothers, you know, Simon and Andrew, then James and John. In doing this, he's recreating the world which he had, we had known after the fall. You know, the first thing that happened after the expulsion from the garden, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, one brother murdered the other. 
Right? Cain killed Abel. Now, the hopes of Adam and Eve must have centered on their children. That's where natural hope is, progeny, the next generation. And here was the first thing they do, kill each other. Pretty rough. <laughs> Yeats, the Irish poet, I'll see more of him tomorrow, said, we are souls tied to a dying animal. And the most obvious form of immortality left open for us after the sentence of death, expulsion from the garden, is simple biological reproduction. Imagine the despair of Adam and Eve when one son killed the other. But that's the situation of merely earthly hope. In calling the apostles, a new story is being told. The world is being recreated by Jesus. Imagine the first apostles of Jesus. They'd been boys, they'd played games, maybe they'd even run away from home at some point. Everyone does. A little later, maybe they set out to seek their fortunes in different parts. They, I don't know, went to Rome, took a job for the summer or something. By the time we encounter them, they're in young adulthood, returned home from their boyish adventures, they're, they're working with their father in the boat. Along comes this preacher who has magic to him that they've never seen before, and they're willing to just leave everything to follow him. Who wouldn't do such a thing? Are our lives, too, not really lived in quiet desperation, watching the time clock for the end of the workday, watching the calendar for the end of the work year, sometimes envying those who've had peaceful deaths and wondering when our own time will come. The Pope speaks of that in the encyclical. He says one reason that people aren't interested in eternal life is because they don't want to live. And the prospect of living eternally, if it's just an endless succession of stuff, is horrible. I often ponder that. Have you thought about it? If you look at the peoples of this world that are dying biologically, they're the technologically most advanced nations. They're just dying off biologically. They're not reproducing. You can adduce a lot of reasons for that, but I suspect the reason is, amidst all this technological glory, life is basically miserable. Because people are made for God and other people, and they're not made for fancy cars or computers. Those do not satisfy the heart. And at some deep biological level, people are saying, no, life is not worth living. And they puzzle because why is it that these poor people have all these kids when they seem to be alive? Hmm? Misery. And no hope. There's no hope. Once you've got your Cadillac, what's there left to live for? So here comes Jesus. And into this tedium there breaks a life such as the world had never seen before. Who would not follow him? That's a green hope, the real green, <laughs> the hope of a new beginning. Now the Holy Father almost identifies faith with hope. In Ephesians 2.12, the pagans are described as li living without hope and without God in the world. Without hope, without God. He spends much time developing the central text from Hebrews. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. He's saying that faith gives life a new basis, and in this faith and hope are profoundly linked. We'll return to that. The only reason anything might spring eternally in the human breast is because God, the source of all that is, is eternal. We are not. For us to be at all, there must be a creator. For us to last beyond our three score years and ten, there must be hope of eternal life. Now, not all traditions are attuned to grace building on nature, nor is it readily obvious. In our own tradition, you know, the poet T.S. Eliot counsels us to hope without hope, for to hope would be to hope for the wrong thing. It's a final angle on this. It's the beginning of real wisdom, at least, in the face of the nature of the world and of the fall which colors all of our experience. Hope springs eternal. Hope is eternally disappointed. Asian wisdom here I find really delightfully re realistic. You know, modern people living in our secularized Christian ambience might content ourselves with Annie's plaintively cheerful tomorrow, tomorrow, but I'm thinking of Zen Buddhism. There's a wonderful story that I love. One of my favorite stories is, it's a saying of a Zen master. Life is like stepping out in a boat that's going to go into the middle of the ocean and sink. <laughs> Period. Period. And if you can't see the humor in that, you haven't faced some obvious earthly facts. Several years ago, I was at the funeral of an outspokenly anti-religious uncle. I was 
graced with the godfather who was fiercely anti-Catholic. But that's family politics. The family had assembled around the ashes, cremated ashes. A well-intentioned cousin took his turn at the podium, and he got carried away in a fight of oratory, gesticulating generously. He said, we can be sure that our uncle is, we can be sure that uncle is, and I wanted to say, is he in orbit? <laughs> because there was no faith. It was based on nothing. God's mercies are without end and judgments are inscrutable to our earthly hopes, but to earthly vision there was nowhere to go, at least as our departed uncle saw things. The Zen master would have been wiser. He would have said nothing and perhaps laughed at the absurd projection. It is this human and natural hope going to our very marrow which makes us very vulnerable to fantasies of all kinds when that hope is not revealed and grounded in the revealed goal which fulfills it, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. We're made in and for Jesus, and only Jesus will satisfy our hearts. And they're restless until they rest in him. The plants may turn to the rising sun today, but they'll wither with the dying sun at the year's end, at least on the South Island. I don't know what happens up here. Their progeny will turn to the sun in their turn, but that's not enough for this generation of which there'll be no memory. For natural and for pagan humanity, the hope is lived through progeny. That's the way of attaining eternal hope. For what dare we hope? It's only as we watch the disappointments of our lives mount that we clearly realize what our hopes were and that on which they were built. T.S. Eliot again, this is the full citation from East Coker. I said to my soul, be still and let the dark come upon you which shall be the darkness of God. I said to my soul, be still, and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith. But the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light, and the stillness the dancing. The tendency of the human heart, the pulsing demand to live by faith and hope and love, anticipates the coming of the gospel, and yet these longings are crushed in this world at every turn. It's as if we've been created for a garden, and everything in us reaches out for the fruits of that garden with everything in us, but there's a giant angel posted with a flashing sword at the entrance to the garden. He has a razor-sharp sword in his hand, allows us to reach out with longing time and again, just in time to have our reaching hands cut. Hope then becomes for us in our earthly exile a many-headed hydra which serves the hidden purposes of nature and nature's God, but offering us carrots on sticks which yet in this world will never satisfy. St. Paul says nature was created in futility, and it's on that note that I end. Paul says in Romans 8.20, nature was created in futility, but not without hope. And that's what scripture tells us. It's a particular twist. For the natural hope of nature is itself futility, but its death can in the end lead to the birth of true hope beyond all earthly hopes. But before we can go there in our next talk, we will turn to hope lost in false expectations. Thank you for your attention. Perhaps we can close with a prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, and eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O, son, o sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Saint Faustina, pray. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A wise old Jesuit told me to always do this at the beginning of a talk. It reassures your audience. 
I hope you can understand me. Uh, I had a seminarian who spent three, three uh, semester in New Zealand, and he said for three months he didn't understand a word. And uh, Winston Churchill said, of course, the English and the Americans were two nations divided by a common tongue. So I, I hope you can make sense of what I say to you. I guess I'm on the screen over there. I'd never seen myself on a screen until I made the series for EWTN. Uh, I did a, a, a retreat series for them, which was televised. And until then, I was in my 40s, and I just was amazed at my head of hair. And I used to comb it in the mornings, and I, you know, it was just a nice, nice blonde head of hair. And then finally, when I saw myself on TV, I said, you're bald. <laughs> the illusions we have about ourselves never seem to stop. So I'm here to talk about hope in three parts. Uh, I'm glad to be in New Zealand, very, very blessed to be with you. I've just had a wonderful week on the South Island. When I was asked to come here, well, I was uh, excited for a number of reasons. I had known Bishop uh, Dunn's sister 25 years ago when I was a student in California, so there's a connection with New Zealand there, and my uh, brother-in-law used to do work in Ar Antarctica, and my sister would come here with him. And then, of course, when the Lord of the Rings came out, wow, I saw that many times and own it, and I just thought if I could get to uh, Fangorn Forest, which I think I did last week, I'd be very happy. So I've loved being over here. And while traveling through the southern island last week, I was struck by the tremendous beauty of the landscape. I mean, I think a lot of people think of New Zealand as kind of a paradise. Uh, Americans kind of say, well, this is in many ways the way America was many years ago before we got so very, very cool. Now look, uh, uh, we are going to meet uh, Father Raymond Gavronsky more fully over the next couple of days, and I'll tell you a whole lot more about him as we come to that. He is a, a, a Jesuit priest, a, a Jesuit of the Maryland province. He comes from New York, but his family is obviously Polish. He's a professor at St. John Vianney Seminary in Denver in Colorado. He's also a spiritual director, and he's great fun. And as I said to him today, now, Father, you're going to open the batting. Um, he's the first speaker. He said, yes, I am. And it occurred to me later, how on earth would an American priest know anything about a cricketing term, opening the batting? And then my friend Bill Moore, who's an American, said, of course he would. It's like calling a batter up for a game of baseball. Of course it is. Ladies and gentlemen, to open the batting on the theme of hope that we all carry so deeply in our hearts, will you please welcome Father Raymond Gavronsky of the Society of Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, we might begin with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that mission of hope, the witness to hope that he brought to us, is something I see myself as kind of continuing. But it's odd that I was asked to speak on hope. When the topic was given me, I thought, oh my word, I'm the biggest pessimist I know. Uh, I'm kind of a one-man darkness club. I, I don't think you have many Slavic people here, so you probably don't know what the Slavic soul is like, but I mean it's just dark, darker, darkest. Uh, and so just a Slavic pessimist by nature. It's in my blood. And yet earlier this year, my provincial, quite before these talks came up, uh, he said to me on a visit I had back east that he said, I was a pillar of hope. And I have no idea why he called me that, except probably I've, I've dealt so much with uh, despair. And so I, I'm going to be talking about that hope for the next few days. The title of my talk was given me is Hope Springs Eternal. The words are poetically pregnant. Now, New Zealand is probably more civilized than the United States, so there may be no need to cite the poem. But the, the words Hope Springs Eternal, of course, comes from, come from Alexander Pope's essay on man. Let me read a few of the lines around that. Who sees crowded and hyperdeveloped, things like that. And driving across that beautiful fjord land uh, where you just think, oh, if I could only live here, you know, how wonderful this would be. There'd be no traffic and no, not, not the pressure of schedules and all this thing. It seems so idyllic, paradisical. In the middle of a field, there was a large cross. 
a large cross. And I said, why would you have that here? Everything seems so perfect. But of course, this is planet Earth, and the cross tells things the way they are. As I thought about these talks, I thought of the great phrase, Ave cro uh, Crux Spes Unica, Hail, O Cross, our only hope. Now, I came back to the States 15 years ago when these Congresses began in 93. After many years in Europe, I had left the States in some despair, uh, hopelessness for the church. I lived in Rome for many years. I was very happy there. And the Lord sent me back to the States to work, and I came in time for the Eucharistic, well, the, the papal visit to Denver. I translated there for the Holy Father, John Paul, and a whole new life opened up for